Hello, it's uh, Paul Beckwith. Um, I'm in the middle of uh, Sand Lake uh, on the ice um, at uh, Marker Boy S311. So you can probably go on the um, Ontario uh, Lake navigation um, site and find uh, information on that particular boy to identify where I am. Uh, but basically, uh, what I want to talk a little bit about is, well, first of all, I'll give you the circular view here to see uh, to see uh, what's around me. So that's, that's uh, you know, just uh, quite a bit of snow on top of the lake. Apparently the ice is about uh, 18 inches thick, I've been told. There's been snowmobiles and so on uh, um, across, so it's, uh, you know, pretty good thickness. You know, you could actually probably almost drive a transport truck across. So that island in the background is um, Birch Island. Um, so basically I want to talk a little bit about uh, geoengineering because there's a lot of misconceptions and a lot of fear over the term geoengineering. First of all, there's a lot of, um, you know, theories out there without scientific basis about uh, you know the, about so-called uh, chemtrails. You know, people hear geoengineering. A lot of the public thinks ah, chemtrails. We're already spraying stuff. They people have no idea why it would be done. You know, there's theories about harming people. This is not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about uh, you know geo. You know, engineering is basically you know making stuff, modifying stuff, uh, using materials, using science, uh, technology to do things that you want to do. I mean, uh, when you consider the history of humans on this planet, um, you know, cutting down a tree is geoengineering in a way because you're modifying the uh, environment. Um, so anything where you actually do something intentionally to modify um, would be under that term. But that term is kind of loaded, so. Let's break it up into uh, carbon dioxide removal, CDR, and SRM, solar radiation management. Um, because of the you know, huge um, warming in the Arctic, the huge Arctic amplification from the Arctic region getting darker, um, and it's getting darker because the sea ice is exponentially decreasing in in um, volume, um, the extent is plummeting, the area is plummeting, so there's a lot more dark uh, water exposed which is absorbing solar radiation causing heating in the Arctic. Same thing with the uh, snow cover um, over the land, mostly in the spring, it's declining at an even faster rate than sea ice, dropping the albedo, and Greenland is darkening like crazy, dropping the albedo also. So the Arctic's getting darker, it's absorbing more solar energy or shortwave radiation, it's warming like crazy, uh, five to eight times faster than the global average. So the temperature difference to the equator is decreased, so the jet streams slow down, become wavier, causing extreme weather events. And these events are taking off. We're also getting lots of surprises in the climate system. The ocean currents are slowing down, so the Gulf Stream has slowed down, basically almost shut off in 2009, 2010, and pushed uh, five inches of extra water, you know, on the U.S. on the coastline of North America, on the East Coast, uh, north of New York City. And uh, the, the sea ice, you know, I think when that water was pushed up in that event um, against the coastline, less of it went up into the Arctic. So because less went up into the Arctic, the sea levels actually on the Atlantic side of the Arctic lowered. So there was more water export from the Arctic Ocean out into the Atlantic. So there was more water therefore coming in the Bering Strait. So that warm Pacific water coming in through the Bering Strait went underneath the sea ice and I think greatly contributed to the warming of the under, nice, under underneath the sea ice and causing the thinning. So we saw an abrupt uh, drop in uh, sea ice sickness as I discussed in a previous video. Um, the graph has a sharp drop in 2009-2010. So we're getting all of these climate surprises and it's going to get worse and worse as the sea ice goes. And sea ice is very unhealthy now. Um, the extent is almost a million square kilometers under what it was in, in um, just before the 2012 maximum melt. So if this con trend continues, we're, we're probably going to see another record low sea ice. And, and very soon we'll have a blue ocean event where there's under a million uh, square kilometers of sea ice in the Arctic. So these weather extremes and all these surprises are going to take off and accelerate. So myself and my colleagues in the Arctic Methane Emergency Group have been um, have, having a very consistent story for you know at least three or four years 
Uh, we need to cool the Arctic. We need to cool it to ensure that the methane stays in place because methane emissions are rapidly rising. You know, as when we're seeing these uh, new phenomena like sinkholes or blowholes in Siberia, where methane hydrates are melting, thawing in the ground, building up pressure, causing explosive uh, ruptures, and uh, so all these things are happening. So how do we cool the Arctic? We use carbon dioxide removal and solar radiation management techniques. So specifically, uh, we need to slash um, greenhouse gas emissions. That's a given, and there's no reason. There's actually some very good papers that show by 2050 we can have 100% renewables. We can accelerate that, and it would be possible even by 2030, 2040. There are studies out there. It's just how how worried does society get? How when do we recognize that the threat is there? I mean, I recognize it, many other people recognize it, but politicians and countries and governments don't recognize it yet and it's staring them in the face and they'll recognize it soon. We'll have that tipping point in human behavior. So uh, we're calling, myself and AMEG are calling for um, solar radiation management. So we need to put sulfur in the stratosphere up in the Arctic. It wouldn't be that expensive to do. And we need to block some of the sun in the summer up there and cause cooling. Um, that could be done immediately um, for not uh, too large a cost and that will give us a bit of time to look at uh, you know implementing other methods like uh, marine cloud brightening cooling the water going up into the Arctic to uh, you know cool the temperatures those are just stopgap measures to try to re return some semblance of normality to the jet streams and therefore lower the extreme weather events um, and uh, you know, other, so but we also need to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Slashing emissions to zero is not going to be sufficient because we've set in motion this machine which is plowing forward the system change. Um, and in the paleo records, we've seen jumps of five or six degrees in a decade or two, and I think that's where we're. we're uh, I think the likelihood of that happening, the risk of that happening now, is very very high. Um, so we need to, we can't wait any longer, we can't talk about things any longer, we know what we have to do, we have the technology, you know, we can rebuild society um, such that we can live sustainably on it, but we can't just sit on our uh, butts and uh, do nothing. And uh, you know, what is a big impediment to action is climate change deniers, and enough is enough. You know, if there's fraud in the media, if there's people spouting anti-science, whether it be people funded by fossil fuel companies or just deniers, they need to be put in their place. We need to take action because these people are a threat to all human humans on this planet. Thank you. I'll do a last scan around. Beautiful day. I'm, uh, I was concerned about uh, snow on the roof of a, a cottage, so I'm going up there to uh, rope myself to the uh, center of the roof and uh, remove all the snow. Thank you.